Beauty Art Nerds. Today we are going to be talking about different types of paints. Now I have a couple of really useful in-depth posts over at natosoup.blogspot.com. I'll make sure to link them in the description here where we talk about where pigments, dyes, and lake dyes come from. But I also have another post just kind of talking generally about paint for watercolor. So today we're going to do kind of a very broad overview. We're going to talk about tubes versus half pans. We're going to talk about different paint formats. We're going to talk about basic paint grading. This is all designed so that you can go and purchase paints with some confidence. I have a lot of paint reviews here on this channel as well. So I highly recommend you check those out to see what paints might be a good fit for you. We're going to begin by talking about just some really common paint formats. Your most basic formats are going to be tube or pre-poured half pan. Now these are extruded half pans so they're a little bit less moist than say liquid poured half pans but if you go into an art supply store pans and half pans and tubes are going to be the most common types of watercolors you're going to see on the shelves. So here we have an example of two watercolors that were poured into half pans. You don't have to use your two watercolors straight from the tube. You can pour them into half pans and let them dry out or you can apply them to say like a baker's tray and reactivate them. Tubes can be one of the most versatile forms of watercolor because you have the option to work with them fresh. You can put them in whatever sort of container you like and they tend to be a little bit more economical than purchasing already extruded half pans or pans like these because with tubes you can typically get about three fills of a half pan for the same price as you would for an already extruded half pan. Now these are Winsor Newton semi-moist half pans. Winsor Newton claims that these are specially formulated to reactivate better, to be more reworkable than poured uh, tube watercolors in half pans that have been allowed to dry. But I did a head-to-head -head test where I pitted the semi-moist half pans against the same Winsor Newton tubes and I found that there wasn't a discernible difference. So really work with what you're more comfortable with. If you are just beginning your watercolor collection, your watercolor journey, it may be more convenient for you to purchase an existing set. This is the Cotman set. I'm not really a big fan of Cotman student grade watercolors. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. I really recommend that you just go ahead and you purchase if you're actually serious about watercolor and you think this is something you're going to stick with, just go ahead and invest in professional grade watercolors. Daniel Smith has their dot cards. That's a great way to sort of experiment with watercolor and figure out what you like. and this would be what such a dot card looks like. This one's already been used a little bit, but as you can see, it has just a little dot of tube watercolor paints applied to a watercolor surface, and you can swatch these or you can use them to paint an illustration. Those can be a great way to figure out which brands you like. Daniel Smith also sells the essential six colors, so that would be a cool yellow, a warm yellow, a cool red, a warm red, a cool blue, a warm blue, and I can show you guys those later in the video. They sell their essential six set in five milliliter tubes, which are very small tubes. It's a perfect way to get a fair amount of very mixable watercolor and figure out if those will work for you. And I have a video here where I talk about such those that set and I show you guys how to mix colors with that set so that would be one of my recommendations is that you begin with that these are Magello two watercolors poured into half pans that's also a very affordable option another common option besides your tube and your already poured half pan watercolors would be what I call watercolor cakes Sakura of America makes the Koi set, and I apologize that the set is dirty. I actually use this set a lot when I'm doing con watercolors. I actually really like this set. This is their little 24 color set, but they're also available in 12, and I believe 36 colors, and then it gets bigger from there to their studio set, which I think has 99 colors, and I'd love to test that out soon. But these are kind of, you can see from this white, which has been barely used at all. They're kind of like extruded little chiclets. Let me see if I can pop this out. I probably cannot pop it out very easily. And with these, they're not really meant to be replaced. In Japan, you can purchase replacements for the Koi set, 
but in the US they're much harder to find. I think you can get them from the Sakura site, but it's basically just the extruded little half pans without the half pans. They've been extruded into these trays. You also have something I refer to as cake type watercolors and the Artist Loft watercolors are very similar to that. These are fine tech transparent watercolors. So like with their mica based watercolors, you can pop these out and rearrange them. But they are very dry watercolors that have been kind of formed and perhaps baked or dried into a round plastic container. Very similar but not quite the same. These are the Jack Richson watercolors. Now these are aimed at younger children. I have a review of those here. These can be great for beginners and it's basically liquid poured watercolors into an existing form and they're not really designed to be replaced. So basically when you run out of, col out of a color with this set, you just kind of keep using the set until it's not usable anymore. Then finally we have the Gensai Tombi style pans. These are larger than your typical western pan. You can fit about three western pans in length but they're also much more shallow. So I would say they hold maybe a pan and a half to two pans worth of watercolor. These are liquid poured watercolor and Gensai Tombi paints are formulated quite differently from western style watercolors. I have a couple of videos here that you guys can check out to learn more about these types of paints. So these are just kind of your very basic types of watercolors that you would see in stores. You also have things like liquid watercolors, like the Dr. P.H. Martin's concentrated watercolors. These are dye-based watercolors. You have the hydrous watercolors, which I've tested in another video. Let me grab one. The hydrous watercolors, which are pigment-based liquid watercolors. They don't reactivate particularly well, but they deliver a lot of beautiful color. You have various types of watercolor markers from the Winsor & Newton pigment-based watercolor markers to the vast majority of watercolors, which are dye-based. And I have a lot of reviews on those that you guys can check out as well to um, like dry dye-based watercolor that's been dried on a substrate like the VV Vel watercolors and the Peerless watercolors. And I have reviews for those here on this channel as well. So you do have a lot of variety in watercolors. You also have things like this, which is sort of a fan-based, fan-type watercolor palette that allows you to kind of have all your colors out at one time. And these are extruded watercolors, very thin watercolor extrusions that have been adhered to a palette. They're not designed to be refillable, but these are very cheap. You can get these on Amazon or through Jerry's. So that includes some of the more unusual types of watercolor. So today what I want to show you guys is I just kind of want to show you the different properties of different types of watercolors. And I want to talk about the difference between say children's grade or very young artist hobbyist grade like this, student grade like these, and professional grade like the Windsor Newton Semi Moist, the Sennelier, the Magello, etc. So I have my watercolor sorted out into three different grades. We have the student or the children's and hobbyist grade. We have student grade watercolors and we have professional grade watercolors. And typically what makes up the difference between these three categories are the binders used, the pigments used, and how much optical brighteners are used. Now if you're not familiar with the term optical brighteners, I have a whole post where I talk about those and why those are not good. But optical brighteners are additives like chalk, talc, just anything that's going to make the color look more vibrant in the pan, the cake, the half pan. What is often sold in the US as being student grade is often sold in other countries as being for children. So for example, these Pintel Arts watercolors, which I will review in the near future, these would be sold in the US as being student grade watercolors. And student grade really refers to people who are learning watercolor. They're more serious about watercolor, but they do not consider themselves professional yet, and they may be going through a lot of watercolor in their watercolor journey. So in the US, these would be marked up and sold as student grade watercolors, but they're really designed more for kids. They're accessible, they have plastic tubes, they have easy to open caps, that sort of thing. So just because something is a children's grade watercolor doesn't mean it's bad and it doesn't mean it's not worth learning on. I also lump the Jane Davenport and Prima Marketing watercolors in hobbyist or 
I don't want to say children in this regard because they're clearly not marketed toward children, but I kind of lump them in with these because I find that their quality is not really sufficient. I don't particularly enjoy using them for illustration, but they could be really wonderful for hand lettering. They deliver a lot of bright color and they're fairly easy to use. So just because something gets lumped in as children's or hobbyist, it doesn't mean it's a horrible product and I'm saying you shouldn't use it. I am saying it's not quite up to my professional standard. Another watercolor that falls into that category would be Arteza watercolors. Now these are watercolors from the tube that I've poured into half pans and they've cracked, crazed, and dried. I used a little bit of gum arabic which is a common watercolor binder to kind of glue them into the half pan so that I can do my watercolor field test with these but they're full of optical brighteners now you see how bright and exciting they look in their little half pans that's because they're full of optical brighteners optical brighteners change the mass tone the mass tone refers to what a mass of the watercolor or the pigment would look like in a pile so you have these which are very bright and enticing I want to compare them with these, which are much more dull, but you can see from the swatches that they actually have fairly vibrant color. Like this mauve here seems almost like a black or a very dark purple. You can see up here that it's actually mauve or transparent yellow here is actually a really nice, warm, sunny kind of golden yellow. So these are professional and these are what I would call hobbyist or children's grade. Now Arteza markets their products as being professional grade products. I have not tried every Arteza product on the market, but the ones I have tried, I will say they are not professional grade products. They're fun, they can be inexpensive, but they're not professional grade products. I also include this fan type watercolor in with the hobbyist water uh, watercolors. Um, partially because it's kind of a gimmick, it's kind of a novelty, and I'm not dismissing gimmicks. Gimmicks can be great for pushing innovation, but you guys can see from how bright the colors are that there's a lot of optical brighteners. Now, not every watercolor that appears bright in the pan is going to include a lot of optical brighteners, but that is kind of one of the tip-offs. One of my other big problems with this is when I put it to the field test, they were really difficult and frustrating to use. I didn't find them suitable to the kind of field work that I do. So they're really more of a toy than they are a useful watercolor tool for me. The Jack Rishon Artists Semi-Moist Watercolors, these are found in the children's watercolor section. They're actually rebranded Yarko watercolors and I have a review of this set as well as the 10 color Yarko watercolor set that you guys can check out. I actually really like these watercolors. They're quite affordable. You get a lot of color. They don't contain a lot of glycerin, which is very common for children's grade watercolor like Crayola, for example, contains a lot of glycerin. That's how they're so washable. Um, Crayola also contains a lot of dyes, which is also why they're so washable. Dyes tend to be water reactive and will come out in the wash. These, for the most part, use pigments, so they handle more like student grade watercolors. So if you're on the market, you're looking for a good learning set, I wouldn't recommend this set in particular. I would recommend the Yarka 10 color set. Then you have weird oddities like this. I believe this is a Banyo watercolor set. I purchased it from Amazon. It's from China. You guys can see it's got little extruded, chalky, they almost look like pastels. They're watercolors. And I have a review of this set here on this channel as well. I really do not recommend this set. And it's got this really strange odor that I've noticed with sets from China. Um, Perhaps because Chinese watercolors have a tradition of being a little bit more opaque because they're designed to be used differently from Western watercolors. Perhaps these are more like those, but I find this particular set to be frustrating and not enjoyable to use. So those are my children's and hobby grade watercolor. I just want to reiterate, it doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make them not useful. It's just that you may struggle to use these. You may find them frustrating. Next, I want to talk about what I would consider student grade. Now, many companies will label certain types of watercolor as student grade watercolor. I don't really review a lot of student grade watercolors because they tend to be expensive enough that I would just purchase the professional and just buy fewer of them. So these would be Cotman watercolors here. And I have head-to-head -head comparisons where I compare Cotman watercolors against Windsor and Newton watercolors against Reeves watercolors, which is made by the same company, Cole Arts, and it's marketed towards kids and hobbyists. 
and I really found that I didn't enjoy using the Cotman watercolors. Now, some watercolors do like Cotman. Some illustrators like Cotman. Some illustrators here on YouTube that you guys enjoy like Cotman. So it's really a matter of taste. I don't like Cotman, but I do like Sakura Koi. I use these really frequently. I like how they handle. I have a review of Sakura Koi watercolors here on this channel. I haven't had a chance yet to review their tube watercolors, but I have about 10 years of experience with their little half pan sets like this and the 12 color set. I find them decently pigmented. They have a lot of color load. They're easy to use. They're easy to activate. They're easy to clean up. They don't take up a lot of space. They're great for travel. You can get good color mixes with them. Just generally, this is the set I prefer over this set. Now with Cotman, Cotman is available in tubes and half pans, and you can replace these half pans. Sakura Koi is available in tubes and half pans, and theoretically, you can replace these half pans. I'll try to put a link in the description below. Both sets can be used for plain air or travel painting. This is a poche size set, so this is large enough to hold a little four by six watercolor block right here. And it used to come, I took it out because I don't like it, but it used to come with like a little removable mixing area that you could put to the side. This set here also has little removable mixing areas, but I find that the size is so small. This is like a scaled down version of one of their larger sets and it's basically designed the same. I find this particular set to be really frustrating to use because it's so small that the mixing areas are basically useless for me. But again, that is my preference and how I paint. You can do it either way. Now there isn't really a thumb hole on this one. You could probably pop this out and put your thumb in here if you really wanted to. I don't think it's designed for that, but you can do that if you have small hands. So this is really not my personal recommendation. Um, I am not a huge fan of Cotman. If you're going to buy Cotman, I say just buy Windsor Newton. And then lastly in the student category, I put the Fine Tech Transparent and Opaque Watercolors in this category. Now typically with watercolor paints, transparency is prized. However, there are several manufacturers that make opaque watercolors, and I believe I have a short overview of a few of the brands on this channel. I will link that for you guys, but um, I typically do not like opaque watercolors. I don't think they handle like gouache. Gouache is what is considered an opaque watercolor, and it's kind of its own thing. These do not handle like, well, these are the transparent ones, but their opaque ones don't handle like gouache. None of the opaque watercolors I've used handle like gouache. So these are their transparent ones, and these are designed for multiple glazes, for washes, for wet into wet techniques, that sort of thing. And that's my preference when it comes to watercolor. Now we're going to take a quick look at what is considered professional grade watercolors. So we have Windsor & Newton watercolors. Now some people are not big fans of Windsor & Newton professional watercolors. I'm on the fence about them. They're okay. They're a good workhorse and you can find them at most stores. So that's why I recommend them. I've used them for years. They're not my favorite necessarily any longer. Sennelier watercolors have a honey base binder rather than the gum arabic that is the Windsor & Newton base. So they're going to remain tacky and liquidy in half pants for longer. That's just one of their working properties, but they deliver really excellent clean color. I have a review of this test pack, which was sent to me by my wonderful friend Kabocha, and a field test where I show how to use these colors to mix a really beautiful, vibrant scene that you guys can check out. These are Mission Magello Mission Gold, which is their highest quality set. It is their professional line, so many companies will have um, different tiers that aren't necessarily like labeled as professional student hobbyist. It's more like gold, silver, and then whatever their brand is, like Shinhan does that. So these are their highest quality watercolors. And I really like Magello Mission Gold. These are Korean watercolors. They do stay a little bit liquid. They do have a tendency to get goopy, but they deliver really, really vibrant colors. And this is another example of where the mass tone doesn't necessarily accurately reflect. You see all of these blues, they're very dark. It's hard to see what colors they are. But look, when you swatch them, they're very vibrant. They're very vivid. They're beautiful colors. The same go for these greens. And even these browns have a lot more color depth than you would assume from the mass tones. So don't be tricked by how pretty the half pans are in the store. What you really want to look for are the swatches. And professional brands like Daniel Smith, like Core, like Windsor Newton will often have a swatch 
area as part of their demo where someone has swatched out the colors so that you can see what the colors actually look like. Hydrus and um, Dr. P.H. Martin's Concentrated Watercolor are also considered professional level watercolors. Now, these may not be watercolors that you would find useful in your everyday painting life. This is, again, a matter of preference. I believe Watercolor Misfit really likes these brands, though. So you might want to head over to her channel after watching this video and see how she uses these and what she has to say about them. But these would be considered professional, especially the Hydrus. Now, typically, what is going to make watercolors professional are going to be the pigments used. So high quality pigments milled to a certain degree and the binders are also going to determine what is a high quality binder. Cheaper watercolors will use things like glycerin or they will use poor quality gum arabic. Core, which is one of my favorite brands, they make the mini palette but they also make tube watercolors. So here's one of their dot cards here that I've been playing around with. Core uses something really interesting called Aquazole, which is instead of gum arabic. And you guys can see that the gum arabic is very very yellow whereas the aquazol is almost clear aquazol is great because your blues like your ultramarine blues which are very warm influenced blues those are going to really pop they're going to really reflect the accurate color instead of mixing in this yellow gum arabic you're going to get kind of a, a desaturated blue and i believe i have a couple of videos where i swatch like all of the watercolors all the professional grade watercolors that i had at that time so that we could compare the colors i will link those so you guys can check them out but because watercolors can be such an investment i really believe in doing your research and becoming quite knowledgeable about them before you invest a significant amount of money so these are two of the binders. Honey is another common binder. And again, glycerin is another common binder that's used in very inexpensive or children's grade watercolors. And the reason for that is because glycerin is very water soluble and will wash out of clothing. Whereas these kind of adhere to the paper. Finally, in a league of its own, we have Gansai watercolors. And I'm sure we could also put Chinese watercolors in a league of their own because they handle quite differently from Western watercolors. So I have here a set of Kuratake Gansai Tambi watercolors. And I ha believe I have a playlist all about Gansai watercolors that you guys can check out. Now, these are neat because they're a little bit less expensive than your typical Western watercolors. Like you can get this 36 color set for about $36. And believe me, a dollar a color is a really cheap price. You're going to typically be looking at paying anywhere from $5 to $13 if you're buying professional watercolors. These are very different from Western watercolors because instead of using like gum arabic or aquazol or honey, they use an animal hide glue. They're intended to be painted much more thickly. And they're very popular for things like edigame cards. These are based on traditional Japanese watercolors, but they've been reformulated to be more convenient. Traditional Japanese watercolors are mixed as you use them. These are pre-mixed and you just add water to activate them. And they're great with sumi brushes. I believe I have a few videos on painting edigame, as well as a couple of videos of using these for Western style watercolors. But they do behave a little bit differently. And that's just something you should go into before or know before you get into them. These are quite popular among crafters and it's for a great reason. You get a lot of colors. They're very inexpensive and they can be really fun to use, but they can be difficult to layer, especially on cellulose based watercolors. They layer a little bit better on cotton rag watercolors because they can adhere to the paper fibers better. They're less likely to just lift up. Okay, so I know I have some head-to-head -head swatch videos here on this channel where I compare different grades from different brands, but I thought it would be really helpful to do a little bit of swatching for you guys and talk about the properties of the different watercolors. So I'm going to be swatching today on the backs of Fluid 100 watercolor paper. The other day I swatched on the front. I want to use up the backs now, less waste. These, this is cotton rag based paper, so I'm really giving these paints the best opportunity to shine. Paints typically perform best on cotton rag paper as they can better adhere to the fibers. Cellulose paper is going to open up a whole new selection of working properties. So what I want to do is I want to select a couple of examples from each tier and swatch those for you guys. 
we're gonna go in order of quality. So I'm going to, I'm going to swatch starting with children's and hobbyist grade and work my way through to professional grade. So we're gonna start with the Richson Rama. And we're not gonna do all the colors, we're just gonna do a few of them so you guys can kinda get an idea. And these are my most recommended inexpensive children's grade, student grade, hobbies grade watercolors. I also really like praying watercolors for similar reasons. And I have a I have a review of those on this channel as well. So I am swatching their magenta, their scarlet. They're yellow. And don't worry, I'm gonna label all of these by brand for you guys. Also, another thing is that children's grade watercolors typically do not come with the colors labeled. It just is what it is. This looks like it might be their ultramarine blue. And I'm swatching with a Sumi brush. And if you're interested in learning more about watercolor brushes, I have a video for you guys. But basically, if you want a very inexpensive watercolor brush that has a natural hair fiber, Sumi brushes are a great place to start. They're a very affordable option for larger watercolor brushes, which as you progress in your watercolor journey, you guys will find are typically the most expensive brushes, the large natural hair brushes. So these are a great way to get some inexpensive natural hair brushes. So that was the Jack, that was the Jack Richson Yam Rama paints. Next, we're going to try these very inexpensive watercolor paints, the Banyo watercolor paints from Amazon. And what I'm going to do is I want to give them the best chance at performing. So we're going to do something called pre-activation, which is when you add a little bit of water to your paint before you start to use it. And you usually let it soak in for 30 seconds to a minute. Kind of depends on the quality of the paints. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to get similar colors. Although we're not going to line them up one to one. So I want you guys to compare how these handle with the Rama paints. I am really trying to pick up a lot of pigment from these. They're very slow to activate. And I found when I did my field test that they layer really poorly and they dry really chalky. So that is a symptom of working with paints that use a lot of optical brighteners. They might go down very bright when you're swatching them and you just have one layer on the paper, but you'll notice that the more layers you do, the more your colors are kind of dull and you're having trouble building up enough color saturation. And that's usually when I've noticed that less experienced watercolor artists start to get really frustrated and they start to blame themselves. But it can be the paints that you're using. Yes, really, really talented artists can use these paints and can turn it into something wonderful. They're able to make these paints perform, but that can take years of experience in knowing how to handle the paints. For someone who is maybe less experienced and they just want to start painting with watercolor, I recommend it's really best not to start with the cheapest stuff. Yes, that's what's the most affordable and the most accessible, but it can be the hardest to use. Another sign that you're working with cheap watercolors is that they tend to make the water look like chocolate milk. Not just dirty, but like light brown dirty. And of course, cheap watercolors will, if they use pigments at all, they're going to use very cheap pigments, but they typically use dyes that have been adhered to a chalk. All right, so those were the Banyo watercolor paints. And finally, for this test, I'm going to swatch the Arteza tube watercolors, and I'm gonna treat them the same way I treated the Banyo ones. And they did not come in this tin. 
By the way, this is a Meaden palette that I purchased separately to house my watercolors. So that's another thing to consider when you're buying cheap tube watercolors is that you're going to need to put them in something. And that's usually an additional cost. So I am pre-activating our watercolors. And I'm not going to use all of them. I don't have a watercolor map for this. So it's actually kind of hard for me to tell which colors are which. I need to make a map for this before I do the field test with these. And making a watercolor map is just really simple. You just use a piece of watercolor paper and you put paint a little mass tone, which is the color at full saturation. You paint a little mass tone square just so that you know where each color is. And I'd added a little extra gum arabic to these because they were so prone to cracking and coming out of their half pan. So that might affect how they handle just a bit. And if you're looking for step-by-step -step watercolor tutorials, I definitely have you covered here on this channel. I have loads of great watercolor tutorials, and if there's ever anything you're interested in learning more about or seeing demonstrated, I have a Friday night art stream where I take requests, so feel free to let me know what you would like to see during our power hours, and those are usually at 8 p.m. on Fridays. You can check my community tab for week-to-week -week information. So as we're swatching, we're noticing that the colors for the most part are very bright. They're very vibrant. There's good color intensity, but keep in mind that this is just swatches. This is just one layer of paint. And what is really gonna be the true test for how well these handle for you is going to be when you do a field test, when you try to paint an illustration. And that's usually when all the problems start to surface. Now I ended up swatching more of the Arteza colors than I did of the other two brands. But I don't know if you guys are able to see this. I will pull in so you guys can see it better in a few minutes. But I'm noticing like cloudiness, chalkiness, a little bit of weird sedimentation in all three brands. All right, so those were the Arteza paints. We're a little bit closer. We can see a little bit better. Some of these paints are still drying. The Jack Richardson Rama paints deliver fairly consistent color loads. There isn't substantial chalkiness. There isn't substantial pooling of colors in one particular area. The Banyo paints do have some chalkiness. They have some inconsistency with the color and they do tend to pool towards the center. So you're not gonna be able to get really even washes. The Arteza colors, um, some of the brighter colors are less guilty of that. The burnt sienna is really, really weak, and some of the blues are kind of unimpressive as well. I do still need to field test this though, so my final verdict on this is still out. But generally, it seems like the Banyo colors are going to deliver the most chalky mixtures. I also want to point out something that I pointed out in a previous video. Different brands may name something the same color, but it may end up being a different color or even a different pigment or a different ratio from brand to brand. So burnt sienna in three different brands can look very different. Think of it when you're purchasing, say, paint for a wall, it might be named something like Lilac Dream. That doesn't really give you much of an indication of what the paint's going to look like. The best way to find out is to look up swatches and to look for swatches in the store as well. All right, so I'm gonna let these dry, label them, and we're gonna move on to our student grade watercolors. All right, next we're going to swatch our student grade watercolors. We're gonna start with our Cotman watercolors. I am going to pre-activate these, like we discussed earlier, and I want you guys to notice how this, pat, uh, this little palette has a preference for rocking. It's another reason why I can't necessarily recommend this particular palette. They do have a sketcher set, which is 
pro it's 12 colors I believe it might be the same colors and it's less prone to rocking so that could and it's also a lot cheaper than this set so it could be a better idea for you And I'm just going to go ahead and take a moment to talk about warm colors and cool colors since we have kind of a 12 color gamut here. So this yellow that I'm swatching right here would be considered a cool yellow. It has a tendency to sort of blue or green and you could mix really nice lush grass with this. Whereas this yellow here is more of a warm yellow. It's closer to red and to orange. You can mix really nice oranges with this. You could, it's like a sunshiny yellow. This red here, Scarlet, would be considered a cool red. It's closer to orange, closer to yellow. Whereas this red here, wait, no. See, I got that wrong. Warm red, this one is a cool red. It's closer to blue, I apologize for that. And in another video, I'll do a color wheel to better demonstrate these properties and explain them a little bit more in depth. So, warm red, cool red. Then we have here, I believe this is their ultramarine blue. I think this set doesn't come with a cool blue. A warm blue. So if you were to mix these two colors together, you would get a purple. Whereas if you mix these two colors together, you're gonna get kind of an olive green. And I really wanna encourage you guys to do color mixing, to experiment and to play around because this is one of, that's one of the best ways to learn about watercolor is by making mistakes and figuring things out and making a mess. That would be a cool green, Viridian green, whereas the sap green here would be a warm green. And then we have burnt sienna, which is usually a very warm brown, and this one is a very orange. And honestly, it's a very desaturated, like it doesn't deliver a lot of color, this burnt sienna. And then we have a sepia, I believe, which is going to be kind of a cool brown. So Cotman uses a lot of hues. Hues are kind of like a substitute color and it can be in a good way, like as a substitute for toxic paints like cadmiums and cobalts, or it can be just for cheaper pigments or more accessible pigments. So hues are usually selected because they handle very similarly to the color that they're mimicking, but they may not perfectly emulate that color. So student grade watercolors will typically include a lot of hues rather than the original pigments. I'm pre-activating my Sakura Koi set now. The set has seen <laughs> Better Days. This is a set that I use pretty frequently, so it's definitely seen a lot of use. And we're not gonna swatch every color. We're just kinda going to do a little bit of one-to-one -one comparison, try to get colors that are close to the colors we've already swatched. So we're gonna start with a cool yellow from the Sakura Poi set. And the Sakura Koi colors do include a fair amount of optical brighteners. I know I was crapping on them earlier. Um, it's just something I want you guys to be aware of. I do different types of illustrations when I use my Sakura Koi set than the sort of illustrations or Kara pages, my webcomic, Seven Inch Kara. Uh, I don't use these for Kara pages. They don't handle quite the way I want them to. So basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to swatch warm colors and then the cool variation of those colors. And then we're gonna do our warm blue, which is ultramarine. And then this set doesn't have a phthalo blue, so we're gonna do indigo, which is typically kind of a cooler blue. And how much water you add to the color is definitely going to affect how saturated and how intense the color is. 
do a little swatch of their Viridian blue-green up here, just so you guys can see it. And then we'll take a look at their Burnt Sienna, which is very opaque and chalky. And then we're going to take a look at, I don't think they have a sepia in this set, but they do have a darker brown. And that's more like a burnt umber than a really dark brown. All right, so at the top we have Cotman. At the bottom we have Sakura Koi. So student grade colors can still include optical brighteners. They can still include dubious binders. They are not completely free of sin, but they can be a great way to practice watercolor and to learn watercolor. And really it's gonna boil down to your preference. I'll move the cup here so you guys can get a better idea of these colors. And if you decide that you don't care for a set, you can always save up your money for a professional set. In fact, that's kind of the, the track they're trying to lead you along is that, you know, you'll eventually get tired of your student watercolor set. It doesn't do everything you want it to be able to do. Maybe it doesn't glaze well or the colors don't mix as well as you would like or you can't achieve some of the colors you'd like. So you start buying the professional version. Now we're going to talk about professional grade watercolors and I want to take a moment to caveat this. Professional grade watercolors are definitely intended for adult watercolor artists who have finished their physical and mental development who are okay with possibly using toxic materials in their work. They are knowledgeable about the materials that they're using, they're knowledgeable about how to dispose, those, dispose of those materials, and they are prepared to take necessary precautions. You may decide that not every professional watercolor brand is for you or not every color is for you. Windsor & Newton has recently released a line of cadmium-free professional watercolors. I have not tested it yet, I cannot vouch for it yet, but you may decide you want to intentionally seek out colors and brands that do not use toxic chemicals. So I wanted to point that out because I feel like that's something that gets kind of glossed over by many art schools, by many art educators, by many people here on YouTube, and I just wanted you guys to be aware. If you have pets, you probably heard my cat meowing in the background. If you have pets, this is definitely a consideration because I don't know about you guys, but my cats think watercolor water is the most delicious water in the world and they will fight me for it. They will growl at me over it. So, um, you know, you can take precautions, but you can't prevent everything. And sometimes it's just better to work with materials that are going to be non-toxic. So we are going to start with the Windsor & Newton half pans. And as we discussed before, these are half pans that were filled by the company, not by me. And they were filled using an extrusion process. And that's basically where you take somewhat dehydrated paint mixture and you extrude it and then you place it into the pans once it's dry. That's different from liquid poured, where they poured into the pan very much like how we would pour our tube watercolor into a pan. Now I'm swatching them a little bit differently than I did before. I apologize. We have our cool yellow, our warm yellow. Our warm red, our cool red. We're about to do our warm blue. And I think this little set I have does not have a cool blue in it. Or not a true cool blue, it has kind of a neutral blue. We're gonna do our warm green, which is a sap green. And yes, blues and greens can be warm. And then we're going to do our earth tones. So this would be our burnt sienna. And I believe this one is a Van Dyke brown, which is a very dark warm brown. So that's our Windsor and Newton swatches. Next, we're going to do our Magello swatches. Now these are Two watercolors that I have put into half pans at home and with these they're very very quick to reactivate 
So you really don't need to pre-activate them. You can basically just take a wet brush and dip it in, swish it around a little bit, and that will get you started. So we've got our cool yellow, and then this set doesn't really have a warm yellow. It goes kind of straight into orange. And different brands will offer different sets, but it's most common to offer a set that will include a cool yellow, a warm yellow, a cool red, a warm red, a cool blue, a warm blue. Now, if you guys like, you can purchase your sets open stock. So you can buy just the colors you want. Certain brands like Windsor Newton, Sennelier, Daniel Smith, you can purchase open stock tubes. It's a little bit less common to find open stock half pans. You can find them on the Dick Blick site, for example. So this would be an example of a cool blue. So if you think of like pool water blue, that's kind of a cool blue. We'll do a warm green, so sap green, and then we'll do a cool green, which is like a viridian or a blue green. And then we'll do a couple of browns. Actually, I want to do their sepia, which is over here. And while it's very, very tempting to amass a huge watercolor collection because all the pretty colors, you really don't need that many colors. You can mix almost any color you need from about 10 colors. Some people say you can mix any color you need from six, but I think you may have difficulty getting certain browns and certain uh, like a dark enough black and certain purples. All right, and then finally, we have the Sennelier La Crelle set, and these are in tubes. So one of the ways you guys can use tubes is, I like to put them in half pans, as I said, but if you're working on like a non-pore surface, and this is a craft mat that I'm working on here, you can put just a little dot, sort of like the dot cards I showed you guys, onto your non-porous surface and then mix those colors with water there. You can also, if you have like a Daisy Well palette, those are those round palettes that have the little circular indents. You can just put a dot at the bottom of your palette and then add water, water as you need it. There's really a variety of ways to paint with watercolors and to use watercolor. So I really encourage you guys to check out some of the other fantastic artists here on YouTube and learn from them as well all about finding a method that works for you and that allows you to make the sort of art that you want to make. I'm just showing you guys some of my methods just to kind of help you get started. So you don't want to paint with watercolor too thickly and that can be a really easy thing to do if you're painting with a tube. Do not paint with these like you would with acrylics or with oils. You want to add a lot of water. With watercolor, just a little bit of paint goes a really, really long way. Which is why, although your initial cost may seem high, it's a very economical method of creating art, especially with traditional media. And this is Sennelier's little test pack. My friend Kabocha sent it to me and I really love these colors. Several of them, in fact, if not maybe all but this one, have made their way into my Everyday Driver palette. And I have a video about my Everyday Driver palette that you guys can check out here. And it's basically the palette of colors and brands that I use when I'm painting Kara pages. And this is our first Payne's Gray. Now Payne's Gray is a convenience color and what a convenience color is, it is a pre-mixed color that you would be able to mix yourself. Like you could mix the French Ultramarine with the orange there in order to get a Payne's Gray. In fact, I can show you guys. I'll set that aside for a moment. 
So basically paints boil down to single pigment, which has just one pigment to make up the color. Multi pigment, which has multiple pigments to make up the color. And then convenience colors, which are pre-mixed and packaged. So you can get kind of a Payne's gray, or you can get Payne's gray by mixing orange. In this case, this is Chinese orange with French ultramarine. And you can kind of change how that color looks by how much of each color you put in. So you can get kind of a brown gray if you have more orange or steel gray if you have more blue. And then this is the Payne's gray that Sennelier included. This one is very warm and kind of rich. It can be used as kind of a neutral or a shadow color. Also mix in a little bit of red, a little bit more blue. Maybe we can get that warm color. Not quite, but almost. But even with these kind of strange colors, you can mix almost any color you want. And I have a video where I do just that. And I have another video coming up where we're gonna talk about color mixing. But just to quickly demonstrate, we took some of their yellow. And in fact, I need to take more of their yellow and some of their blue, and you can get kind of a fresh spring green. You can take some of their blue, which actually has a little bit of yellow in it, and some of their red, and you can start getting purple hues. And we already mixed the blue and the orange. Now the nice thing about mixing professional colors together yourself is you'll start getting these beautiful sort of sedimentations where you get different colors sort of sediment out because the particle size for different pigments can vary. So larger pigments are more likely to sediment out into like the little valleys on your watercolor paper. And the smaller pigments are more likely to kind of disperse out. So this is usually seen as a good thing. It's something a lot of artists look for and intentionally try to get rather than just kind of a very flat uniform color. So I'm gonna get this mess cleaned up and go ahead and label our professional watercolors. All right, so I've got everything labeled and I'm going to set it aside to dry. I think that just about covers everything except for the fact that I promised to show you guys my Daniel Smith Essentials palette, which they were sold as, give me a sec, haha. -ha. They were sold as two watercolors, but I actually put them in a little emergency like pill case, little first aid kit. And these are the essential six. So we have our cool colors and our warm colors. And I added a burnt sienna and a lunar black so that I would be able to mix more colors. This is what I mean about a paint map. And this is just a really small, inexpensive watercolor kit that I put together myself. You can buy half pans off of Amazon and you can put your watercolors in an Altoids tin. Your initial startup costs don't have to be that high. And this is just perfect to put in a purse to take on the go and to do some field sketching. So I'm gonna swatch, set this aside. I will swatch these guys for you really quick. So I hope that you guys have learned something about watercolor paints. I hope you've learned something about different grades of watercolor paints. Perhaps you've learned something about different brands of watercolor paints. I have loads of different, and I just remembered, I didn't even swatch the Gansai Tom before you. I have loads of different watercolor videos here on this channel for those of you who are interested in learning more about painting. In my next video, we're gonna talk about the color wheel and we're gonna talk about mixing colors from a limited palette. I don't want this video to seem like I'm glorifying owning all of the colors. What I really recommend is you guys buy kind of a standard palette that's suited for your use. And I can make some recommendations if you're interested in doing watercolor comics, because that's my own specialty as well. You buy a palette that's already suited for your use, and then you add colors as you need them. A little palette like the Essential Six can be really inexpensive. And then stores like Plaza, Jerry's, and Dick Blick have sales pretty frequently. 
or if you are careful with your Michaels coupons, you may be able to scoop up a really good deal. So I recommend you approach watercolors strategically and rather than collecting them like Pokemon, you collect them, I guess, like magic cards where you just get what you need rather than trying to catch them all. So before I say goodbye to you guys, I do want to go ahead and swatch some of the Gansai colors for you guys. This is the Kuratake Gansai Tombi 36 color set. It's one of the larger Gansai sets available. And these are really quite economical. You can get the little 12 color set, you can get a 24 color set, you can get the 36 color set. I think you can also get the half pans through various stores. You can get metallics, I think you can get neons. So these can be a great way to very cheaply begin your own watercolor journey. So I'm trying to select a warm example and a cool example. And you can get the Gansai Tombi set from all sorts of places. Plaza sells it, Dick Lick sells it. Um, I don't think Michael sells it anymore and I don't think Jerry sells it anymore. Paper and Ink Arts, which is a calligraphy store, sells it. You should not have any trouble finding this set online. If this is, if watching me swatch these colors is like, yep, that's the set for me. And I have to be careful with these because the mass tones do not really give a clear indication of whether a color is cool influenced or warm influenced. So trying to be careful about that. Now if you paint with these, these are designed to be painted very thickly. So as they absorb water, you may notice they tend to get kind of, I called it gluey and I think I've called it soupy before. That is a, prop, a working property of these paints. You don't have to work with them like that, but that is what will happen if you pre-activate them and let them absorb a lot of water. That can be great if you are doing edigame postcards or painting on washi paper or rice papers though. So really it kind of boils down to what kind of watercolor you do, what kind of effects you want. Do you want to have, you know, deep opaque colors in addition to thin light transparent luminous washes it really boils down to what you're looking for so I recommend again that you check out other artists here on YouTube and you follow some watercolor artists on Instagram just for inspiration and that was our Gensai Tombi just a few select swatches all right, art nerds, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me for this video. I really hope it was useful, helpful, and informative for you guys. I hope it will enable you to make decisions when you are purchasing your own watercolor sets. Do not hesitate to reach out to me either through the comments or via email or through a DM on Twitter. Those are my preferred methods of contact. If you would like specific recommendations for your own use case, I am more than happy to help. And if you came to me, if you found my channel through the workshop I did with MTAC, welcome. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope it adds to your knowledge base. And I hope you found the workshop helpful as well. If you enjoy this sort of watercolor content, I would really appreciate it if you guys would take a moment and hit the subscribe button and hit that bell notification so YouTube actually lets you know when I have a new video up. If you ever have any questions or if you want to see something demonstrated live, make sure you join me during Power Hour, which is usually on 8 p.m. CST here on YouTube. It is a live stream art and drawing event. You are welcome to make requests, ask for demonstrations, and ask questions. In fact, I, I am begging you, please come hang out with me. Let me get to know you and get to know me during that event as well. If you like what I do and you got some money to throw my way, you can join the Art Nerd community by heading on over to patreon.com slash soup and becoming an official Art Nerd. Official Art Nerds get early access to videos like this. They also get behind the scenes videos from my making comics classes and backer exclusive stuff like monthly mini prints, 
sketchbooks, and more. So if you like what I do and you want to help me continue to do it because you know art supplies are expensive, joining the Art Nerd community is a great way to do so. If you are looking for more watercolor content, I've got that here on this channel and I've also got a really great blog over at natosoup.blogspot.com. You guys got to check out my watercolor basics series. I highly recommend it. It is really in-depth and really useful. And if you want to see some of my art, you want to see some of my skin in this game, I highly recommend you head on over to 7inchcara.com or 7inchcara.tumblr.com and read my beautiful watercolor webcomic, 7 Inch Kara. I think that about covers it. I will see you guys again really soon with a color mixing video. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I hope to see you guys again really soon. Bye guys!